Judge, this is this is all we got today. Um, I understand that. We apologize. We're, we're doing our best. I'll fall on the sword. It's not a problem, guys. No, I'm, I'm, it's all. It's all. We're, we're, but we will. We're going we're gonna to scramble and try to get the full day tomorrow and Thursday. I'll just leave it in general terms of what we were doing, and do not take any inference for me making them wait. stuff going on and I might have been a little seemed upset this morning you're to disregard it it had nothing to do with this case okay second judge Cocroft was down during the lunch hour okay we went through exactly what I wanted we was hopefully to have it approved by the end of the day okay and that's removing the plexiglass in the second level in front of you and in front of the box Okay, now we dealt with something on the break and this is one of those judge things I have to do, okay? Because of what I did, we're gonna be a little short this afternoon. So it's my fault. We had anticipated much longer proceedings and we don't have enough people in line. So because of my ruling, you're gonna to go home early, okay? Blame me. Okay, but it's just the reality. We're trying to schedule this thing here with professionals and everything else, and it gets difficult at times. You know, we've tried our best to keep on a schedule. Some days we move quicker than others. Okay, it's just one of those things. So, my apologies to you guys because I know your time is valuable. We've tried to help you as much. Darcy says that we've been answering a lot of problems. I know I've been signing a bunch of stuff. Okay, for you guys. But we want to, I want to show you the respect that you're due, too. So I'm basically saying it's on me. Uh, we can work from there. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we ready for our next witness? Yes, Ms. Grubb? Thank you. Uh, we call Dr. Thomas Brady to the witness stand. You guys have a good lunch? Yeah. Mediocre? No one flooded sugar your way? <laughs> yeah. This is supposed to be here. What's supposed to be there? You can go ahead and take it out of there. Can you reach through and grab it? Yeah. Okay, he's going to swear you in. Let him get by there. Yes, sir. I could have you raise your right hand, please. You swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Here's the second seat of it, and you're so comfortable. And you would be so kind as to state your name for the record and spell your name, please. My name is Tom Brady, uh, T O M B R A D Y. 
Okay. You gotta help me out a bit. You're kind of a fishbowl there. So I know I can see people spraying a bit. So give me some volume. Okay. Okay. Fair enough? Fair enough. Okay. I feel like, I feel like I'm shouting now. <laughs> okay, well, it's okay. I'd rather have that than mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Dr. Brady, we have a court reporter that's right to your right, and she's taking down everything. So if we get into um, maybe some medical terms that might need spelling or some help, she'll uh, raise her hand or signify that she needs that help. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And thanks for coming. Um, sir, uh, let's talk about your education and background. Can you tell the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, where you went to school and what training you received? Yes, uh, after I graduated from the University of Dayton, uh, I went to Wright State University for my medical school. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in pre-medicine. And after uh, medical school, I went, uh, I took a position at Mount Carmel as a resident. And I did three years of internal medicine residency there with my final year being a chief residency year. And then right out of residency, I joined my current group, which is Columbus Inpatient Care. Thank you. Have you worked at any other hospital system or hospital other than Mount Carmel? Um, uh, years ago, we worked at uh, Fayette County Memorial Hospital in Washington Courthouse. Uh, they had asked for us to provide hospitalist services there, and they have since secured their own hospitalist services years ago. Okay. And um, could you give us some uh, frame of reference as far as um, when you graduated from med school and when you started at Mount Carmel? Uh, yes, I graduated medical school in 2004, and I started uh, shortly after that uh, residency and graduated residency in 2007, and then was board certified that same year in internal medicine. Sir, uh, what are your current assigned responsibilities at Mount Carmel? Uh, currently, I'm an attending physician and hospitalist at Mount Carmel. Okay, thank you. And has that been uh, your uh, assigned responsibilities since your employment there? Yes, I've always been a hospitalist. I I'm not employed at Mount Carmel. We're contracted with Mount Carmel, but yes, I've always been a hospitalist. Thank you. What shift do you work? Uh, it varies. I normally work the daytime rounding shift. And Sometimes, uh, well, oftentimes I'll work the evening shift, and very rarely, unless there's um, a definite need or a spot to fill, uh, the, the night shift. But it's been years that I, from when I worked a night shift, so. Would it be fair to say that um, you are an attending physician at Mount Carmel? Yes. Okay. And um, were you an attending physician at Mount Carmel uh, in uh, the pertinent years for this case, including the year of 28, or, uh, 2018? Yes. And that was Mount Carmel West at that time, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And um, at that time in 2018, did your duties as an attending include preparing discharge summaries for those patients for whom you were an attending? <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm going to hand you a document uh, which is labeled States Exhibit 10B. States Exhibit 10C documents. Thank you. Oh, you want me to give them back to you? I, I, I will. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to um, go ahead and reject them once you move the team what they are. See it on the screen in front of you and also on the big screen. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 So let's do. Oh, we have, okay. Sorry. Just make it 10 
Dr. Brady, uh, the new 10C um, is uh, entitled Discharge Summary. Did you review that? Yes, I did. Just now? Yes. And have you reviewed it recently? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to project what I believe to be the first page. According to what you know for what the electronic medical records look like at Mount Carmel, does this appear to be the first page of the discharge summary for an individual by the name of Bonnie Austin? It does. Okay. And she was admitted when? Uh, it's covered by the oh. thing down here. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Admitted uh, 9 30, 2018. Okay. At what time? 2104. Okay, and what time is that? 9.04 p.m. Yeah. And then uh, she was discharged that same day, correct? Uh, yes. She, she died that same day. Okay. Yes. At 11.53? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Moving down, we have a list of, um, I believe, final or active diagnoses. Do you want to... Uh, review those? Yes, I have reviewed them. Okay. Uh, could you explain what they are? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, acute respiratory failure requiring intubation is a respiratory failure that happens all of a sudden, and it requires that a tube be inserted in your throat with a machine uh, to breathe for you. Oftentimes, you um, are not able to do that yourself, so the physicians or EMS will do that as part of a life-saving measure. Um, that S slash P means status post, which means they have just been through a full cardiopulmonary arrest, which meant that her heart stopped and she had stopped breathing. Tension pneumothorax, status post emergent chest tube placed in the ED, which is emergency department. And so a tension pneumothorax is a diagnosis where air escapes the lung and it causes um, instability in your heart and lung function because air is pushing the lung and not escaping the normal way as you breathe it. Every time you take a breath in, air is pushed um, and pushing the lung um, into the um, pulmonary artery and other um, vital organs. So it, it can cause an arrest. History of myocardial infarction means that she has had a previous heart attack. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a lung disease that makes it sometimes hard for people to oxygenate and to breathe normally. This is normally emphysema or chronic bronchitis. Chronic respiratory failure is likely related to her chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which just basically means she has a hard time breathing in general. Um, Hypertension is high blood pressure, and stage four chronic kidney disease means that her kidneys are in um, the process of deteriorating, and this is stage four out of five. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to the next page. Does this appear to be the second page of the discharge summary? It does. Okay. And um, at the top, there's a paragraph describing um, some historic things about this lady. Um, can you tell me uh, who wrote that? 
Uh, that paragraph was probably a combination of myself and um, one of the people I work with as a physician assistant who would have um, done uh, a preliminary um, history and physical. Okay. And so we take the information from the history and physical or our current plan and we'll often include it in the discharge summary if we think it's pertinent. It, it looks like this lady had um, a procedure in the emergency room, is that correct? Yes. And what was that procedure? It looks like um, a chest tube was placed in the emergency room. Um, what does somebody do to do that? Uh, I think in this case, uh, the ER doctor tried to put um, a uh, emergent chest tube in and then called for the surgeon to come put uh, an official chest tube in. So when a surgeon puts a chest tube in, they make an incision in the chest wall and basically put um, a larger bore tube in to alleviate the air pressure that's crushing the lung from the tension pneumothorax. Okay. And um, what did, do you, can you tell from here what that tube looked like, how big it was, or anything about it? I cannot. Okay. And then going further down, uh, it appears as though uh, there may be some um, medications listed. Correct. Correct. Would these be her home meds? They would be. Okay. And then there's a third page, which with uh, additional medication information. Uh, what is that? Is that a continuation of the previous list? That is a continuation of the previous list, okay. yes. All right. And then some other stuff that um, we don't really need to worry about, immunizations, and et cetera. Correct. And that would be the total of the discharge summary. Yes, ma'am. Oops, I misspoke. There's one final page. Page four. What's on there, sir? Uh, lab results from her hospitalization. Okay. And what do we know about her? She's five, uh, 152 pounds, right? Uh, yes, her, her measurements, her height and weight, yes. Yep, yeah, yes, yeah. okay. And at, at uh, discharge, she is deceased? Correct. attending also include preparing a death certificate if the patient passes away? Yes. Um, what are the requirements for preparing a death certificate? Uh, in the state of Ohio, uh, it, 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 to my knowledge, it is uh, a physician has to um, put down the most likely causes of death for the patient and there's stipulations even within the death certificate that tell you that you can't uh, just put a simple reason like cardiac arrest or cardiopulmonary arrest. You have to have a reason that that arrest occurred. Okay. So they, they, it's on the death certificate that they ask us to do that. Okay. <laughs> Sir, I showed you a document previously uh, that was uh, entitled Progress Note. It's now labeled State's Exhibit 10D. Did you review this document? Uh, yes. Okay. <coughs> this appears to be uh, written by someone other than you, correct? Yes. Could you tell us what this says and what it means? This uh, appears to be a note by the bedside nurse. Just um, explaining the progress of the patient since they came into the emergency room, uh, since they came into the ICU from the emergency room. Okay. And um, it says that patient lost pulp, 
pulse five times and ROSC each time, what does that mean? Return of spontaneous circulation. Okay. And then uh, the patient was intubated. Uh, and there was a right chest tube that we just talked about. And I assume that that tension uh, pneumo is what we discussed before, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, upon arrival at ICU, patient was externally paced. What does that mean? That means that there was a device placed on her chest to help her heart beat at the correct rate because her own pacemaker, her natural pacemaker was not working. Okay, what does that device look like? It looks like electrodes that are placed on the person's chest. Okay. Just like two sticky electrodes that are placed. All right. And then there's a note about the family deciding to with, withdraw care, correct? That's what he wrote, yes. Okay. And that the patient was medicated with 600 micrograms of fentanyl, 4 milligrams of versed, and extubated, correct? I see that, yes. Okay. It also says that um, both you and Dr. Husel were bedside. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, does this progress note appear in the electronic medical record? Um, I, I think so, yes. Okay. Um, were you at the ICU, beds ICU bedside with Ms. Austin? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, what had occurred prior to your arrival at the bedside? Um, she had already been um, ex palliatively extubated. She had already been extubated. The tube was already taken out of her mouth. Okay. And so what decisions were made before you got there? Um, other than the decision that she would be on my service as the attending, all of the other decisions were made. Okay. And, and when you say they were made, who were they made by? The ER provider and, the, and Dr. Husel. Okay. Did you observe the administration of the fentanyl and Versed? I did not. Um, did you ever review the MAR in this case prior to preparing the discharge summary? I did not. That's not my usual custom to do. Okay. Um, did you review the MAR or the medication administration record in this case prior to testifying today? Yes, as part of her medical record. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been labeled State's Exhibit 18J. appear to be Dr. Brady? That appears to be a copy of the death certificate. Okay. I'm going to place the top part on the projector. Who does this appear to be? Mrs. Bonnie Jean Austin. Okay. Um, is, is that lady the individual we've been discussing here in the medical records? It is. Okay, thank you. Now I've got it um, down to the cause of death section. Um, what did you list as cause of death for um, Ms. Austin? Attention pneumothorax that was likely due to a complication of her chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Okay. And um, there's a signature here above where it says Thomas Francis Brady. Is that your signature? Yes. Okay. And uh, sir, uh, is there also noted the date that you prepared this? Yes. Okay. Sir, at any 
time during her hospitalization or prior to preparation of the uh, discharge summary, were you aware of the uh, amount of drug um, that she was provided at the point of extubation? No, I was not aware. Okay, thank you. Cross, Mr. Baez. Please support. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. You're a Tom Brady. Correct. Must be pretty easy to get a dinner with. <laughs> it's very disappointing, but I disappoint people on a regular basis. So. <laughs> Austin was a very sick woman, correct? I would agree. And when she arrived at the hospital, essentially her heart had already stopped, correct? She had had a cardiac arrest prior to the hospitalization, yes, sir. And her pulse, of course, she had no pulse? Uh, I think by the time she arrived at the hospital, it had returned. Okay. Um, so at one point, she was... That's legally dead. I heard you say. I think at several points. Correct. Not the record. That is the record. Uh, were you to relax? Let me roll. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll sustain. Let's rephrase. Sir, um, while she was at, well, when you see this in your experience, sir, and someone's heart stops, the chances or the likelihood that it's going to stop again. Is a pretty, there's a pretty good chance that that's going to happen again, correct? Object. He's, he is not being offered as an expert in this matter. Okay, he's so within his experience. I'm staying consistent. You may answer. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. In, in your experience as, as a doctor, as, the attending physician, as an attending physician, when you see a patient come in that their heart has stopped, odds are pretty good that it may stop again. Well, right? The question was likely to stop again. No, please don't mind. Okay, I got it. May I answer, Your Honor? Yeah. Okay. Um, it depends on the patient. Okay. Um, and in this patient, her heart stopped on five different occasions while at Mount Carmel, correct? Uh, I, yes, I think so. Okay. And she was essentially actively dying, was she not? I can't say that because, excuse, I'm sorry, could you ask me that question again? She was essentially actively dying, correct? Based on... No, and you're, he's asking, and you're, as a tending physician, she died. So the so the terminology actively dying is one that we reserve for when someone is near the end of their life, near death. She had been resuscitated several times. So during that, you would not use the term actively dying. There were attempts to, to resuscitate. She was actively dying once she was extubated. Okay. Now, in going back to your discharge summary. Actually, I'd, I, I want to take you to your history and physical. And this is Joint Exhibit 10, page 10 and 15. Okay. So do you see Miss Austin's name there? Yes, sir. And this is your name here as the attending? Yes, sir. And it says history and physical there? Yes, sir. And apparently the entry, that's your name? Yes, sir. And the date of the entry, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Now, um, in here, you note that you had, uh, I, I guess, examined her after her 
Uh, it's late in the day for me. The endotracheal tube was removed? Uh, yeah, endo, yes, endotracheal, yes, sir. Close enough, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and it was part of the de-escalation de of comfort measures. You know here that she was having agonal respirations. Yes, sir. Okay. And for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what does that mean? Agonal respirations is a term that we use when someone is having intermittent gasping respirations. It's, it's a normal part of the dying process. Uh, it does not indicate that they are in agony. It's a way that I can communicate to another healthcare professional that this, what this patient's breathing looked like. So agonal respirations would indicate intermittent, slow, gasping breaths. And to a family member, based on your experience, this is quite a frightening sight to see, correct? Object, Your Honor. Sustain. This is not a pleasant sight. Wouldn't you agree? Object. I will not permit. Um, it depends on the, the patient's family's perception of their suffering. So some families will, I, the first thing you would ask is, do they, is this person comfortable? Do, does your mom or your dad or your brother, do they appear comfortable? And some people, it, it is very difficult to see. For some people, it may be better than what they were seeing earlier. It just, it just all depends on their presence at bedside. And when a doctor is engaged in comfort measures, one of the things that they try to preclude from happening are these agonal respirations, correct? Object. I'll permit it. Generalize it. I understand. I'll permit it. Um, can you clarify prevent? You don't, want to, you don't want the patient to have to endure or engage in agonal breathing, correct? I, I think it's a little bit more complex than that. We, we will try to explain to families this is what the dying process looks like, this is what to expect. They may have these um, problems. If you think they're uncomfortable, let us know and let your nurse know immediately. So yes, we try to prevent discomfort, but once again, agonal respirations does not always equal discomfort. But it can. It, it can, yes sir. Okay. So, and then your next note is, and had no, I'm not even going to attempt that one. Auscultated. Auscultated heart tones. That basically means you couldn't hear a heartbeat, correct? Correct. Okay. So, from what you're seeing at this point, her heart stopped before she stopped breathing. I, you can't tell that uh, from auscultating. So someone's heart uh, can be very weak and I could not be able to hear the normal lub-dub of the heart that you hear the heartbeat. Um, it would indicate her heart was very weak and her pulse was very thready. So I couldn't tell you by listening to someone's heart, um, it, the whole clinical picture, there, there could have been some circulation occurring at that time. But you can't say that her heart was beating at that point in time, can you? Uh, you can't say it wasn't either. That's not my question. You can't say. Object, Your Honor. He's answered. Okay. Sustained. Next question. Sir, at this point in time, with Ms. Bonnie Austin's care, could you hear a heartbeat? He's answered that already. because of the time fading away. I will withdraw the question. Is there anything in it, the, is there anything that's not accurate about she was having agonal respirations and no oscillated heart tones? There is not. Okay, so you didn't make any misrepresentations there, correct? I did not. Okay. Now, um, You testified, sir, under direct examination that you did not know what, what uh, Dr. Husel had ordered, what medications he had ordered for Ms. Austin prior to the extubation. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Okay. And you're aware as a attending physician, it's your duty to write an accurate 
discharge summary? It is my duty to write a complete discharge summary that would summarize the patient's hospitalization. So accuracy is not an important factor for you? That's not what I said. Well, my question was about accuracy. So if you can answer my question, as it relates to the accuracy, is that important for you when doing a discharge summary? As accurate as possible, yes. And part of that, part of your duty in addition to that is being thorough, is it not? Part of my duty as a physician in general is being thorough, like all physicians, yes. Specifically as it relates to the discharge summary, part of your job is to be thorough as well, correct? The, uh, I would disagree. So you don't have to be thorough? It's a summary. So the discharge summary is a summary of events. Being thorough uh, could make a discharge summary not be a summary. It could be uh, you, would, you could send the entire medical record to a doctor's office if you're concerned about being entirely thorough in a summary. But the point of the discharge summary is to summarize what happened, not to give a play-by-play -play account of what happened. You don't have an actual independent recollection of what, in fact, you reviewed to write this discharge summary, correct? Basing it just on the records? Uh, yes. Okay, so as far as your concern and your testimony to this jury is what I wrote is what I wrote, that's as much as I can remember. Is that a fair way of summarizing it? Uh, I would say that's fair. Okay. And in addition to that, if there is something that's written, you would testify to this jury that's accurate, right? Uh, it depends on what we're talking about. So because something that you would put down in a discharge summary that's not accurate? That, that, that happens in the medical record all the time that somebody could put, accidentally put an inaccurate thing in there. Okay. So, like sometimes if you're dictating and you say um, 50, it could say 15 years old and that could go into the medical record. And if, if you don't have a chance to review it before someone else sees it, then that can happen. So, sir, um, fair to say you reviewed these documents thoroughly before coming to testify, right? Uh, I reviewed them, yeah. You knew I, you were going to come and testify in a murder case, right? I did know that, yes. Counsel, but, stop. You know better than that. Let's re-ask the proper question. I thought that was a proper question, Judge. I apologize. No, you know. Um, again, I apologize if it was improper. Now, sir, um, in light of this, you were shown, well, let me ask you this, on page... of Joint Exhibit 10, page 10 to 15, you indicate that a decision to withdraw life, withdraw care has been made by the family at bedside. They state, quote, she would not want to live like this. And then you put in quote. You would only put that if in fact someone made that statement, correct? Um, I did not write that. Okay. You got that from a colleague? The physician assistant who signed that note right below there wrote that. And then my job is to go through review, and then my addendum is at the beginning of the history and physical for my colleagues to review to make sure that they know that I reviewed that. So that quote would have been something that was said to a different provider. If I can have just a moment, please. Alverna Hesburgh, PA. 
That's the physician assistant you're referring to? Yeah, I, and uh, I've seen an exam independently of her, so I saw and examined the patient without her. Okay, and, it's, and then you put exam and history confirmed, right? Correct, yeah. Okay, and you agree with the current plan as modified? Correct. Okay, so basically you looked at what she looked at, and you agree with it and you confirm it, right? Correct. So in here, she states that she reviewed the notes, labs, course to date, correct? That's what it says. And you just testified that you reviewed it as well and agreed with it, right? Yes. So now I'd like to show you the note that the prosecutor showed you a moment ago. And that is State's Exhibit 10D. Do you see that? I do see that. And this is a note, a progress note from a nurse? It is. And in there, it states that the patient was given 600 micrograms of fentanyl and four milligrams of Versed for comfort care. Do you see that, sir? I see that. Now, sir, you're aware that Dr. Husel sits here today because he gave 600 micrograms of fentanyl to this patient, correct? Since, yes, okay. since then. Okay, I'll permit that question. Let's see where he goes with it. Sir, you have not been charged with murder, have you? Okay. Relevance? You were present at that side, and you reviewed these notes? Object. It's not going with, with the witness. Okay. Well, well, as to your first question, I'll sustain the second question you can answer, even though it's reserved. Sir, have you been named in the lawsuit? Okay, let's go sidebar on all this. Ladies and gentlemen, I hear you guys in the back row have that plastic glass that's going to stay, guys, between you. For 10 minutes. I'm going to be on break for 10 minutes. I'm in my dome here that I hate. Okay? Um, we'll get back to you here momentarily. Okay. All rise. Seconds. You can't discuss your testimony with anybody. We'll be right back with you, okay? So you sit here or go out? You can go on out and relax. All right. Thank you. 
And I think Dr. Husser was in the vicinity as well. Okay. Uh, and and Miss Austin. What about the chaplain? Uh, I can't remember for sure. I know the chaplains are involved, and so I would I would have to say the chaplain was probably in the ICU at the time um, because of this being such a traumatic thing. Okay. And you can't say that Dr. Husser Dr. Husser was not present, correct? Correct. You just don't remember? I don't remember. And as it relates to these records, your discharge summary, your history and physical, you don't have any independent memory of, of what you actually looked at or the process of when you actually completed these documents, correct? Uh, I, could, I could say what I usually do. Okay. I, I'm talking about specifically on, on this discharge no, summary, this history, this history. You have an independent memory of this situation. Yeah, no, I, my memory is, I don't have a photographic memory. I'd, I'd have to review the records, I don't. And you don't have any reason to doubt its accuracy in any way, shape, or form? I don't know. I haven't reviewed the entirety of the record, so I, I can't say that I have no reason to doubt the accuracy because I, I didn't I didn't go over it with a fine tooth comb. There could be things that I didn't review sprinkled in there that I don't know. I want to try and get a direct and, and simplified answer from you, so I'll ask it this way: the records that you've been shown here today which includes Joint Exhibit 10, page 10 through 15. As well as Joint Exhibit 10, page 91. You have no reason to doubt the accuracy of those records, correct? I have not been given a reason to doubt the accuracy of those records. I have no further questions. Uh, just one last question. It's, so the documents will just speak for themselves, right? Well, no, that's not the intention of the documents. The documents can speak for themselves what's in it, right? Once again, that's not the intention of the documents. I didn't ask you for its intention. The document so, is what it is. Okay, you no, don't have any reason to... Do you have a question here yes. instead of an argument? Yes. The documents are what they are. You have no reason to doubt their accuracy. That's my question. All right. I asked and answered, Your Honor. I would draw the question, Judge. Are we drawing? Yes, sir. Okay. Redirect? Just briefly, Your Honor. Thank you. Dr. Brady, is it your typical practice to review the entire medications uh, administered uh, uh, record prior to writing a discharge summary? No, not when um, the outcome was uh, like uh, not abnormal. So I would not review the entirety of the MAR when I th the patient is discharged in a manner that I would think was uh, consistent with their hospitalization. And was that the case in this case? Yes, I didn't. I didn't. Objection, Judge. She's testifying. He has no memory of it. He's testifying as his to as to his practice, Your Honor. So you kind of made a statement that is this case. Uh, let's ask a question. Okay. Re you want me to rephrase? Rephrase. Um, in this particular case, to the best of your recollection, would you find um, a uh, outcome in this matter to be unusual? No. Thank you. That's all. Your excuse, Doctor. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.
of the day? Okay, now, I know what's going on in your head. How long is this going to take? We, we have our schedule planned ahead of time, but I'm the one who knocked out part of the day. We're still on schedule. Okay? So, I know it's easy to prep. I can't make any representations or promises, but we're trying real hard to stay on our time. search term and you said that was not okay. I wanted some permission or rather I'm asking for permission that the two witnesses tomorrow I intend to um, during my line of questioning there are 1600 page documents um, and I want to do a line of questioning with respect to how many times the name comes up in the 1600 uh, page document and I would like permission to not have to print the 1600 pages and do it on my laptop. Can you do it ahead of time? No, because I don't, if, if I want to show the juror, the, the witness, <laughs> uh, when they deny something, it's for impeachment purposes. I understand that. Okay. I didn't, you're asking to culminate something, so you're going to need to do a word search for each? Um, no, it would just be pulling up a document on my laptop um, for impeachment purposes, typing in the name, and it will show the number of hits within the document. Entire 300,000 pages? 1,600 pages. 1,600. Yeah, I, I'm, I would prefer not to have to print it out. Because if, if the court says no, then I'm going to have to go old school and print out 1,600 pages and highlight every time their name appears. No, 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 no. I don't have a problem with the things you do, okay? We need to make some record exactly what you did. documents on a zip drive and mark them as an exhibit. You can do that too. I just don't know. I can. But um, you run into the same issue of where you at in that exhibit. You're impeaching them on specific behavior. That's right. Okay. <laughs> where in the where in the documents? So when you figure out which all your hits are, that's fine. That's a logistics issue. You got the underlying document. What I'm saying is drawing your attention. You're going to show them the document on the field day soon. Mm -hmm. Just refer to the page as part of that exhibit number. So it's page 477 of the big exhibit. You see what I'm saying? Yes. 
see what I'm saying? I do. I do see what you're saying. Uh, my impeachment based on behavior would be more than it would surprise you to know that it, within this report, your name appears 306 times or on 306 pages. Yeah, and I don't have a particular problem with that. Okay. Because you would have had the exhibit in there. It can be checked. I just want some latitude on it because you stopped me from that line of questioning on the expert and I want to not be stopped if, with the court's permission because I really don't want to have to print out 1,600 pages. I don't think we want you to print okay. 1,600 pages. Just, I don't mind you using the zip drive. I don't mind you using your computer. Just when you do, when you focus, what's the page number inside that document? Okay. Reference point for her. You would have it right there in front of you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else for the record? Nothing to say. No, Your Honor, nothing for us. Okay, guys.